Welcome back. This is be Lecture 7, Part 3. And I want to finish off what we started in our last class. And I was going to skip it and move on to another section, but then I thought, since Mark itself, one-fourth of the book, deals with, really, the Passion Week of Christ. Let's finish this off so that you can break that whole section down. Um, and really, that one-fourth starts in Mark chapter 11, okay? In verse 1, and it goes all the way to the end in Mark chapter 16. So I just want to, I, I, I thought about it, but I said, no, I better not. Let me, let's go through this, just break this down, break the book down, so that you have an understanding how, how, how I look at the introduction, because all we've been doing, all, all we have been doing is basically introduction. All, it's all we've been doing is just introduction, introduction, introduction to what the book of Mark is, how to begin to look at it, how do I approach it, what is the emphasis, um, who is the audience, why is Mark's perspective the way it is, is because it's through the eyes of Peter, right, and so forth. So let's take this next section. If, remember the ten, major 10 point outline breakout that we did? So we're going to go to point number seven now. Point number seven in that major outline that you guys have in front of you, all the ones you should have downloaded by now, and that would be this. <laughs> number seven, the Son of God's last Jerusalem ministry. The Son of God's last Jerusalem ministry, Jesus' warning and conflict with all the religionists. Jesus' warning and conflict with the religionists. Now, this is going to cover Mark chapter 11 verses 1, all the way to Mark chapter 12, verse 44. So let's break that section down in a way that, uh, so that kind of help you to approach the book, uh, uh, the book of Mark here in the New Testament. As I've, as I repeated in the past, you can divide this any which way you want. This is just one, the approach that I'm just taking for the purposes of this class. So we can see it's now point A all the way to point L, point A to L. So let's look at this. Point A, the triumphal entry, the triumphal entry, a dramatic warning, Jesus is the Messiah. Now, this falls logically into place, because if you recall in our last class when we were having this discussion, right, we were talking about earlier that Jesus had dealt with this on the point number, if I remember it here, it would be okay, very early on. Where we dealt with the when we dealt with God's God's version of the Messiah, if you remember that, and we discussed that in detail. And so I want you to see this with me, okay? And that would have been point number five that we dealt with. So I want you to see this with me so that you have a handle how this moves into now. Jesus comes in the triumphal entry and declares, I am the Messiah. Okay? He makes this very, very clear here, and, and, and it's a dramatic warning that he is, if you recall that. So that would be Mark chapter 11 on the point A, the triumphal entry, a dramatic warning, Jesus is the Messiah. This is Mark chapter 11, verse 1, all the way to verse 11. Point B, point B would be the fig tree cursed. Remember that scene? A warning against a fruitless life, a warning against a fruitless life. That's Mark 11, verses 12 to 14. We, I think we need to be reminded of that today. Okay. Uh, point C, the temple cleansed. The temple cleansed. <coughs> Excuse me. The temple cleansed. Um, a warning to those who abuse God's temple. Uh, I think we need to re-preach that today in the postmodern church. You see so much of the church, the temple itself, the, 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 the presence of where the corporate body gathers together, um, if you will, uh, has become uh, a, such a casual setting to the point that we really disrespect the presence of God. You got those who have all these groups coming in, and they're selling their CDs and all of their or, and all of their ministry stuff, and they turn the house of God into the hands of the money changers. Oh, you got people sitting in the audience now in the temple in the sanctuary, okay? And they're having their lunch, and they're having their dinner, and they're having you know their breakfasts and so forth and so forth in a very casual, flippant way, just completely disregarding the presence of God. 
So we have the ten, point C, the temple cleansed, a warning to those who abuse God's temple, and that is Mark chapter 11, verse 15 to 19. Point D, the conditions of prayer. The conditions of prayer. This is Mark chapter 11, verse 20 to 26. And then point E, the authority of Jesus questioned. The authority of Jesus questioned. Okay? The two choices concerning Jesus. And this is what he does with this issue. Remember, this is the last week of his life. This is what over a third of the book of Mark is dealing with here. And that would be Mark chapter 11, verses 27 to verse 23. And then point F, the parable of the wicked husbandman the parable of the wicked husbandman, husbandman, and that is God in Israel. That, that issue finally gets tackled on here, and this is Mark chapter 11. It'll be verse 27 to verse 33. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 12, verse 1 through 12. Mark chapter 12, verse 1 through 12. And then we get a point G, the question of civil and religious power. The question of civil and religious power, the state and God. Now we get to this issue of state and God, which has always been a hot button topic in the, in the, in the modern church today. And that'll be Mark chapter 12, verse 13 to verse 17. Mark 12, 13 to verse 17. And then we get a point H, the question and the proof about the, uh, 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 of the resurrection. The question and the proof of the resurrection, that is in Mark chapter 12, and it starts in verse 18 all the way to verse 27, 18 to 27. And then we get into point I, the question about the greatest commandment, the question about the greatest commandment, that's point I, and that'll be verses 28 to 34, Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 34, and we get to, uh, as well as to point J, that is the entangled, the entangled idea of the Messiah, the entangled idea of the Messiah, and that is Mark chapter 12, verses 35 to 37. And then we're going to point K, the warning of the crowds and the religionists, some things to guard against the warning of the crowds and the religionists, and that is Mark chapter 12, verse 38 to 40, verse 38 to 40, and finally we get to the discussion about real giving, the widow's might, the widow's might, real giving, and that is Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. All of this is taking place in that week, that week. This is right, this is right at the outset, this is all breaking loose here now. Uh, 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 of, of the Passion Week, which is why more than a third, a little bit over a third of the, of the book of Mark is dealing with this week alone. And so if you were trying to follow this chronologically, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, no wonder uh, you just lose your hair out of this, like I have, okay? And you lose your hair out of this. So you need to understand that this is canonized, okay? And it is organized by, by, by literature, John Drock, Okay, and it's organized through the eyes of each one of the gospel writers of how he chose, he had the freedom to, choose, to, to organize his thoughts and write them out relating and, and, and having distinct emphasis in different parts of the ministry and the life of Jesus. Now we get a point number, we get to point number eight, point number eight of the big outline of that we gave a couple of classes ago. And that would be the Son of God's Olivet Ministry. The Olivet Ministry. Okay? Jesus' prophecy of his return and the end time, or what we know, okay? So I want you to understand that this takes place in the in the in the garden in in in, 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 in that in that setting. And you see this, okay? And he has this long discussion about the end times, okay, when he's going to return the end times, and this is where he gets, but it's fast paced, remember, and this is point A, the signs of the end time, point A, the signs of the end time, that would be Mark chapter 13, Mark 13, verses 1 through 13, verses 1 through 13, and then we get to point B, B, the most terrible sign, which is the abomination of desolation. The terrible sign, the most terrible sign, the abomination of desolation. And this is discussed in detail, but rapidly. In Mark chapter 13, verses 14 to 23, verses 14 to 23. 
And then we get a point C, that is the coming of the Son of Man. The coming of the Son of Man, and that will be Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 27. And then point D, D. This is a short outline for point number, point, point number eight, and that is this. Point D, the end time and its warning to the believers. The end time and the warning to the believers. This is Mark chapter 13, verses 28 to 37. So you begin, so you, now you understand what the Olivet ministry was. Okay? It has this discussion about the Olivet ministry. You hear it mentioned all the time, and people go, well, what is it? You know, Jesus, Judas went up, you know, Judas went up and betrayed him, and that's about the shortest version and some kind of a version of an idea that you hear from most people uh, when they talk about the Olivet ministry. And they go, well, um, that's, you know, that's a very small part of it, but let's move on. Now, we go to point nine. Point nine will be the Son of God's passion ministry. The Son of God's passion ministry. And this would be Jesus' supreme sacrifice. Jesus' supreme sacrifice rejected and crucified. Rejected and crucified. Now we get to here in Mark chapter 14. And this is Mark 14 starting in verse 1. And we're going to go all the way to Mark 15, 47. Mark 14, 1, all the way to Mark 15, 47. And that, this whole section discuss, discusses this issue here. So what we're going to do here now is we're going to go through here. We're going to go to point A all the way to point M. A to point M. So let's break this section down. Uh, point A, Jesus' death is plotted. Jesus' death is plotted. It's a picture. It's a picture of the Passover and Jesus' death. That's what. That's what this is picturing here. And that'll be Mark chapter fourteen, verses one through two. Mark fourteen one through two. Point B: Jesus anointing at Bethany. Remember that it's a study of love. Um, this is uh, this is on the way, okay, to his death. This is this is um, Mark fourteen verses three to nine. Point C, uh, Jesus' betrayal, why a disciple failed. Jesus' betrayal, why a disciple failed. This is Mark 14, verses 10 to 11. Point D, uh, Jesus' last chance to Judas. It's the appeal to a sinner. The appeal to a sinner. This is his last chance that he has with Judas. Okay? And this is Mark chapter 14, verse 12 to 21. Verses 12 to 14 to 21. And now point E. Jesus' institution of the Lord's Supper is taking place at during this during the Passion Week. And that will be Mark 14, verses 22 to 26. 14, 22 to 26. Point F, Jesus' prediction of Peter's denial takes place here. How Jesus treats failure. Notice how he treats the failure, uh, very, very different from how you and I treat the failure, much different. Right? And that would be Mark 14, verse 27 to 31. Mark 14, 27 to 31. And then, so you're beginning to see how all of the, this is fast pace. I mean, you, when you think about it, when you think about what's taking place here, Okay. Sunday, Monday, remember the triumphal entry, or what we would call Palm Sunday, okay? And this is fast paced. This is moving from Sunday to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, okay? This is moving really fast here. And so we get a point, we get a point G, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane bringing the weight of a great trial, okay? He's bearing the weight of a great trial on his shoulders. This is Mark 14, 32 to 42, Mark verse. 14 verses 32 to 42, and then point H is Jesus' arrest. Now he's finally arrested, his, uh, the arrest of Jesus, and this is a study of human character. Uh, we see this in Mark chapter 14 verses 43 to 42, Mark 14, 43 to 42. To 52, I'm sorry, Mark 14, 43 to 52. And then we get a point I, Jesus' trial before the high priest. 
Jesus trial before the high priest and look at the weak and strong character. We see that that's, that's clearly displayed in, in this whole section here. And that will be Mark 14, verse 53, all the way to verse 65. 53 to 65. And then we get to point, uh, we get to point um, J, Peter's denial. It actually takes place now. It's a lesson in failure. I think it's a lesson that all of us can learn from here. Uh, and this is Peter's denial, a lesson in failure. And this would be Mark chapter 14, verse 66 to 72. Verse 66 to 72. And now finally we get to uh, point K, Jesus trial before Pilate. Jesus trial before Pilate, and that is the picture of the morally weak man, a morally weak man, and that would be now chapter 15, Mark 15, the first 15 verses, verses 1 through 15, and then we get a point L, Jesus' cross, an outline of his mockery and the events, everything that takes place upon that cross, and that is Mark 15, verse 16, and this is a longer section. It goes from verse 16 all the way to verse 41, and we have a deep, in-depth discussion taking place there. And then we have, finally, point M, Jesus' burial. A discussion of courage takes place here, Jesus' burial, and that will be Mark 15, verse 42 to 47. And now we get finally to point number 10 of the global outline that I gave you originally several classes ago. And we finally get to the end of the book of Mark. And that's Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 20. And that point number 10 would be the Son of God's supreme ministry. His supreme ministry, Jesus' victory over death and his great commission. Jesus' victory and his death and his great commission. So we have two points there. A, the proof of the resurrection. The proof of the resurrection is dealt with in Mark 16, verses 1 through 13. Mark 16, verses 1 through 13. And point B, the Lord's great commission. The great commission is dealt with in a fast-paced fashion here, and that's going to be verses 14 to 20 to the end of the chapter of the book of of Mark. Now, what we want to do now is we went from a global 10-point outline to breaking down the book in all of its chapters in sections within that major 10-point outline. Now we're going to go into a, a detail. So we went from a global to regional, now to a regional, now to a local, if you will. So let's do that together and see where God takes us. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull some examples out of this. Island. Let's go back to point number one when we look at the book of Mark. Okay? And now what we're going to do is we're going to take that global outline, that regional outline, and now we're going to make a local outline, if you will. So we're going to go from a general statement, okay, to more specific statement, to a detailed outline of that one. Do you follow me? So let's do this. Let's go back to point number one of your major global outline, the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel, okay, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And what we're going to do, and this, is, this covers Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. And what I like to do is now let's break that down even further. So let's go back to Mark. Mark chapter 1, okay, just as an example of what I'm talking to you about. This I really need you to get a handle of the book itself. Okay? So let's look at this. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. So we know it starts in verse 1. He says, the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of, the, of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. 
verse 4. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all of the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sin. Look at verse 6. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. Verse 7. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Verse 9, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming out of heaven, he saw the heavens, it says, opening, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him, and a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Look at verse 12, immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. Verse 14, and now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God, and saying that the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Verse 16, <clears throat> And he's, as he was going along the Sea of the Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew and the brother of Simon casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going in a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat and mending the nets. <coughs> Excuse me. Immediately, this is verse 20, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in that boat with their hired servants and went away to follow him. So now this first section, okay, we're going to go is we're going to break it down a little bit further so that you have an idea how to break this down the rest of the book. And so let's let's we're going to use two or three examples for the book of Mark. So if I was going to take the book of Mark and I look at the first 20 verses in this global outline of point number one, the beginning, you remember that? The beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a five-point sub-outline here, okay? Right? Five-point sub-outline. A, Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, the good news and the messenger of God. That would be Mark 1 through 8. Point B, Jesus Christ and his baptism, a decision for God. That would, point, that would be Mark 1, 9 through 11. Point C, Jesus Christ and his temptation, the dealing with temptation. That would be Mark chapter 1, verse 12 through 13. And then we go point D, Jesus Christ and his message, the good news of the gospel. That would be verses 14 to 15. And then we get a point E, Jesus Christ and his disciples, the kind of person called. What kind of person is called? That would be Mark 1, verses 16 to 20. So now, what you've seen here is that we've taken these 20 verses here, and now we've broken them down into five sections. Now what we're going to do is we're going to break the first section down even further so that we have a cogent approach and presentation to the book of Mark. Also, it helps me when I'm studying, breaking out, okay, what, is, what is this talking about? What is it? How is it organized for me? Okay? Because one of the things that we struggle with in the postmodern era is logic, right? We're always fighting with our logic. Well, what is he talking about? How did he go from this, how did he go from this subject to this subject to this subject to this subject? Okay? And so what we have here is that we don't have a lot of run-on sentences. That's not what we have here. What we have here is that thoughts are organized by events. And so I want you to appreciate what is in fact taking place in the book of Mark. And what we're going to do is we're going to break it down even further so that we have a better handle and a better understanding of how to begin to look at the book of Mark. Welcome back, this is Lecture 7.4, and as we left off in the last class, we began to look at the book of Mark and breaking it down into some details to give as an example uh, how to look at this New Testament book, the book of Mark. 
And if you recall, we had given you a global outline and a very extensive outline to work with. Now let's break two of these down as an example to get into the meat of this book. So what we're going to do in the book of Mark, we're going to start right at the beginning. So go back, and if you recall, in our last class, I had given you point number one, the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I gave you five points, point A, B, C, D, and E. If you recall that, that should be in your notes. You should have picked them up in the class, picking them up today, as well as those of you who are tuning in should have downloaded those notes by now. And what we've been looking at is at looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. And in those five points, we're going to go to point A. That would be Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, the good news and the messenger of God. What we're going to do is just go to the very beginning and do a very simple outline to try to ascertain what is being addressed here. And you look at Mark chapter 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written, he said, In Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance, it says, and for the forgiveness of sins, and all of the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with the water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out, up, up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved son in you I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel." And as he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew and the brother of Simon casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Coming on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. So as we look at these first 20 verses, just as a brief, brief, extremely brief example, what we will do on the point number one in the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and under that we have point A, the first sub-point, which would be Jesus Christ John, and, and John the Baptist, the good news and the message of God. Now let's begin to break this down in some kind of a way that you can hang your hat on that. And so we would do it this way as an example. We would put point number one on the point A would be the gospel of God. The gospel of God, because that is noted, that's noted clearly here in verses one and two. We can see that. All right? All right. And then on the point number one, you would put point A and B. Point A and B, it would be it would be uh a concerns Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That would be verse 1. B began long ago. The prophets foretold it. That would be verse 2a, the first part of the verse. So you, you're going to write this out, lay it out in such a way for the purposes to follow. And, and the reason why I'm doing this is so that you have a way of flowing through the text. And, you know, many times people get, they begin to get in the pulpit, or you hear somebody in the radio, or you hear them on, on a video, or, or you hear them in a, at a Bible study, and they'll go ahead and proceed to read a text, a verse, and they'll just ramble on to a lot of other little subtopics 
that is never really accounted for in the text itself. If you're going to preach the text, then preach the text. You can use illustrations and you can use examples and so forth, but you have to stay within the text. Somewhere along the line, you've got to come back to this text. And whatever example, whatever illustration you're using needs to stay with the text. So as we look at this, so we're going to write this out quickly. Point number one, right? In the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, under that will be point A. Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, the good news and the message of God. Under that would be Roman uh, be, uh, Rumoral, uh, be number one, the gospel of God. And that will be verses one through two A, the first part of two, uh, verse two. Then under that, you're going to put point A, little a, concerns, G, concerns Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Next to that be verse one. And then little b, point B, began long ago, the prophets foretold it. In, and you put next to that verse 2a, the beginning of verse 2. Then you go to point number 2. The promise of God to send a messenger to prepare for his son. For his son. The promise of God to send a messenger to prepare for his son. Next to that, you put 2b, the second half of verse 2. So we're looking at verse 2. 2A would be, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, so this is talking about long ago when this, this had been foretold, point 2B would be, uh, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. So we understand why he's being sent, because he's preparing the way. Then under that, you would put point 3. He says, the mission of God's messenger, and that would be verses 3 to 5. Verses 3 to 5. The mission of God's messenger. So let's break it down even further. On the point number 3, you would put point A, to be a voice. Hmm? To be a voice. For what? To prepare. To be a voice. That would be verse 3. We can see that when it says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Then on the point B, you would put point B under that to baptize, to baptize. We could see that at the beginning of verse 4a. You next to that, be 4a, it says, John the, Baptist appear, uh, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance. And then we would put to preach repentance and forgiveness. So that would be 4b, 4b, 4b. We just read that. And then under that, you put D, D as in David. The impact, many respond, many respond. So we see this in verse 5. And all the country Judea was going out to him, and all the people Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So you can begin to see how the text flows through this. And then we go under that, we put a large number four, point number four, the Spirit of God's messenger, it's called self-denial. And that would be in verse 6. Verse 6, the spirit of God's messenger, safe self-denial. We see that in verse 6 because it says this. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locust and wild honey. You can't get any more self-denial than that. Right? He did not engrandize himself. He was not becoming, he was not the number one person to look at for absolutely anything anything. So he was involved in self-denial. It's talking about the messenger. Then under that you put point number five and would be the messenger of God's message. The message of God's messenger. The message of God's messenger. Now we can see this in verse seven and eight. Look at this. So it would say this. And as was preaching and saying, after one is coming, who is mightier than I, I am not fit to stoop down to un and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with the water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we're going to break that down. We would do it this way. And the point five, we would put the messenger, the message of God's messenger. So A, point A, little a would be the preeminence of Christ. The preeminence of Christ. Christ. We could see that at the beginning of verse 7, right? Because it says it very clearly. He says, and he was preaching and saying, after me one is coming who is mightier than I. So we see the preeminence of Christ. Under that you put point B, point B, and that would be the power of Christ. Next to that, verse 8. 
the power of Christ. Verse 8. So we see it here. He says, I baptize you with the water, but he will baptize you with what? With the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about power, absolute power. So you begin, and that, that's just a very short outline, okay, of how we would break down point 1A, right? The beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, and then that A, Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, the good news and the message of God is the first eight verses. And we can just continue that all the way down the line. Now, what I want to do is now take you into, go to um, chapter 2 as an example. So let's go to chapter 2. Now, chapter 2 becomes a little much more complicated than that <clears throat> uh, because now it's getting involved in one of the major stories, okay, and the display of the power of God. So what we want to do is take you now to, on, the, on your main headline, on your main outline that you were working with, we have point one, and remember, we just finished point one, and we did a little subpoints. Now we're going to go to big point number two, which is the Son of God's opening ministry, Jesus' immediate impact. This is now the beginning of his ministry and the immediate impact that he has. So we're working on the point number two. <clears throat> so on the point number two, we would have <clears throat> a lot of, if you recall, we had a lot of points, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, and just an extensive point. I want to get the point G as an example, okay, in that outline that I gave you a couple of days back in a number of the classes back. So here's what we're going to do. Point two, the Son of God's opening ministry, Jesus' immediate impact. That would be verses 1, verse 21, all the way through chapter 3, verse 35 of the book of Mark. Mark 121 all the way to Mark 335. It covers that whole section in there. Within that section, there is going to be a subpoint. There's A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. I want to just get the point G as an example. Okay? And we're going to go Jesus' power to forgive sin and its impact. Jesus' power to forgive sin and its impact. All right? The forgiveness of sin. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So we look at that verses 1 through 12. We understand that, <clears throat> that there's a paralytic that's going to be healed here, but there's something else that's being discussed here. So let's look at that very quickly here in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer, there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. So this man is completely paralyzed. Verse 4, being, made, being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug it, an opening, they let it down on the pa and they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. So they pierced the roof, they break through the roof, okay, and they lower him down. Okay? And it says here, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? Is he blaspheming? Who can forgive sins but God alone? He says, immediately, Jesus is aware in, the, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning, and they were within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, which he says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out into the sight of everyone. So they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So here's the theme that we're going to work with in this section of Scripture. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. We're going to go, and we're going to skip a points A all the way through F, right? And we're going to go to point G. Jesus' power to forgive sin and its impact, forgiveness of sin. So, as we begin, if I were going to introduce this subject just, just briefly as an example here, and we're going to do a brief introduction of it, introduction of it in the book of Mark, <clears throat> I would say the man who seeks forgiveness of sins truly seeks with a desperation that will not quit, will be forgiven. This is the great lesson learned from the man with the palsy. This is what this is talking about. Okay? This man was, 
he was determined, okay? He would not quit. Uh -huh. And so under this, we're going to create a six-point mini outline. Six little sub-points under this. So on the point G, we would have Jesus' power to forgive sins and its impact, the forgiveness of sin. So we're going to go point one on the point G. Point one, Jesus returned to Capernaum and many months later, verses one through two. Number two, point two, the prerequisite to being forgiven. That's verses three and four. And then we would have point four, the question aroused by being forgiven. That's point six and seven, uh, point six and, uh, verses six and seven. And then number five, the source of being forgiven. That would be verses eight through 11. And number six, the impact of being forgiven, verse 12. Now, now as I'm moving along here <clears throat> at, a, at a clip of a pace here, it's because you should have your handouts, you picked up coming to the class, and you should have downloaded your handouts in those of you who are tuning in. So we're trying to cover a lot of ground in a relatively short period of time, and so we're moving at a fast-paced clip because you should have the handouts in front of you in order to be able to follow. So then if I was going to look at this, and we break this down a little bit further, so I'm looking at this. Okay, so now I have six points, right? Jesus returned to Capernaum. The pre number two, the prerequisites of being forgiven. Number three, the reality of being forgiven. Number four, the question aroused by being forgiven. And number five, the source of being forgiven. And number six, the impact of being forgiven. So that's the main subject that we're going to be dealing with here. So I go to point number one, and I would read Mark 1 and 2, right? Right? As I read that out, I will look at that in verses Mar uh, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. So as we begin to look at this, we can see here. And what happened? In this scenario is that Jesus returned to Capernaum after many months of preaching throughout Galilee. Okay? And you go, well, how do we know that? Well, we know that because in Mark chapter 1, verse 39, it says, And he went into the synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. <clears throat> so he finishes up there his ministry, and then he moves on to Capernaum. The preaching tour had lasted about 12 months, basically. That's how long it took for, for preaching through this, through this area. And he apparently returned to Peter's house and was, as always, the news spread quickly. He, and the crowds began to gather and flood the house. So that's the scenario that's being built around this particular section of Scripture. So note what Jesus did. He went about his primary mission, which is what? He preached the word to them. That's what he's doing, right? Because it says it very clearly here um, in, in verse 2. It says, and many were gathered together, uh, uh, were gathered together, so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. So we can see this very clear. What is taking place here? Stay within the text. Okay? Don't go off on you know on twenty little bunny, bunny trails. Okay, the great stories, great illustrations, funny jokes. The problem is that you're not within the text. So we look at this. So what, is, what was his primary mission? What was his primary mission and what? He preached the word to them. So no doubt, obviously, as we go through the text here in verses 1 and 2, uh, some had come for the ministry, obviously. Okay? That is to have some need met or to be healed, and not what we have in the church today. And some had come out out of curiosity. Some just come out of curiosity as well. Okay? However, note that what Jesus did, first of all, he did the main work of God. He proclaimed the word of God to men who were lost eternally. That's the main work. So when you're looking at this scripture and you're breaking it out within the New Testament context, okay, what was the main work that's being discussed here, okay? He proclaimed the gospel. He proclaimed the word of God. What is the main work when you stand in a pulpit? It's to proclaim the word of God. That's your main job. But what happens today is that we major in the minor and minor in the majors, okay? And so we kind of flip this thing around. So now we go to the next two verses. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter two. Look, let's look at verses 3 and 4. 3 and 4. So we look at this and he says this. And they, and, they came, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, being unable to get him because of the crowd, be, being unable to get to him okay, because of the crowd. They removed the roof above him. <clears throat> And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. I mean, that's an incredible, that's an incredible story. 
when you when you understand it. So what is that? What is what is really taking place here is one of the issues that we're going to have to discuss. So if I was looking at this, I would title this section point number two, which would be the prerequisite of being forgiven. Okay, and that is uh, uh, here. Here's what we're looking at. <clears throat> it would be perseverance, faith, forgiveness, and as an invitation. That's all you see. All that being displayed here in these two verses that we just finished reading here in verses three and four. <clears throat> the prerequisite to being forgiven was clearly demonstrated by what? By what had actually happened, what had actually taken place. So we will go on to that. We go point number one. The man came to Jesus. Actually, this man was brought to Jesus by four other men carrying him on a coat-like pallet. Okay? Actually, this man. Okay. So I want you to know. So I want you to know two significant things about this. Okay. A point A. The man was desperate for help and very hopeful, having heard about Jesus. And B, the man was counted as a very near, dear person, okay, by the four men. Obviously, these four men had extreme affection for this man that was, who was a paralytic. Oh, they wouldn't have done what they did. Mm -hmm. this, is, they, this is indicated by what? By the extreme action that they took to reach Jesus. What did they do? They climbed the roof, they dug a hole, and they laid him down. I mean, how many friends you got like that that would be willing to do that for you? So obviously there was a bond here between these men and they expressed a deep concern for the paralytic as well as faith and hope in the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So the point is very clear here when we look at these verses that the first prerequisite is forgiveness, okay, to forgiveness is what? It, you actually got to come to Jesus. And that's what they did. They came to Jesus. They brought the paralytic man to Jesus. A person must come to Jesus for what? For forgiveness, even if he has to be brought compared the invitation of God. You see, when he says, come, right? Now, remember that we're, we're, when, we, when we started out in Mark chapter 1, if you recall, at the, at the, at the beginning of verse 2, uh, and then we got to the second part of verse 2, and he's talking about the prophet Isaiah, and that was the invitation. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says this, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, and though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be made as wool. So here, what, here what we have, an invitation. That's what Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 is talking about. We're given an invitation to come to the Lord. And that's really what has to happen. Whether you come on your own or you are brought. And that's the point of that's taking place in this story.